This is a lecture on the immune system medications, part two. First, we're going to look at anti-infective medications. Anti-infective medications are classified by their mechanism of action or their chemical structure. Anti-infective medications include antibiotics, antitoxins, antifungals, antivirals, and antiparasitic medications. Infection is the single most common reason for drug therapy. Antibiotics are given to treat infections caused by bacteria. They target microorganisms such as bacteria, fungi, and parasites. However, they are not effective against viruses. If you have an infection, it's important to know whether it's caused by bacteria or a virus. Most upper respiratory tract infections such as the common cold and sore throats are usually caused by a virus, so antibiotics do not work against these. Bacteria are named based on their shape and their ability to retain stain. Gram-negative do not retain the stain and gram-positives do. Whenever possible, blood, sputum, urine, or tissue cultures, depending on the symptoms, should be collected before giving an antibiotic. For labs, a CNS or culture and sensitivity may be ordered by the physician. A culture is a test to identify the bacteria or the fungus that causes the infection and a sensitivity test checks to see what kind of medications, such as antibiotics, will work best to treat the illness or infection. Antibiotics that are bactericidal kill the bacteria. Those that are bacterial static slow or inhibit the growth of bacteria, weakening or eventually leading to death of the bacteria. There are three ways that antibiotics work. They destroy cell walls, they inhibit protein synthesis, or they inhibit RNA and DNA synthesis. When the cell wall of bacteria is destroyed, it is killed. Without its proteins, the bacteria can't carry out vital functions, including asexual reproduction. When we inhibit the RNA and DNA synthesis, the bacteria cannot multiply. In general, antibiotics can cause GI disturbances that range from nausea and vomiting to increased bowel movements to diarrhea. Antibiotics kill the infecting bacteria, but they also kill some of the normal flora or that good bacteria that helps with food digestion and other processes. This normal flora is helpful as long as it stays in the GI tract. When their numbers decline, less food is digested and then moves out more quickly as diarrhea. Because antibiotics kill that good and the bad bacteria, some physicians in the hospitals are ordering probiotics for patients on antibiotics to help restore that normal bacteria. We must always be really diligent about checking for allergies with patients who are on antibiotics. When the patient says they are allergic, always ask for details. They may have experienced the common side effects that we just talked about, like nausea and vomiting or diarrhea or it could have been a serious adverse reaction like anaphylaxis. Again, signs of anaphylaxis is rash, pruritus, laryngeal edema, and wheezing. Patients should be instructed to call 911 if this occurs. If patients have allergic um, reactions with antibiotics, they should carry an identification card in their wallet. If the patient is complaining of common side effects like that nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, first always make sure that they're not short of breath. Then have them continue the medicine, help them deal with those symptoms, and then always have them notify you or the physician if the symptoms get any worse. Again, antibiotics destroy healthy bacteria in our bodies which help fight off infection and aid in digestion. When these healthy bacteria are destroyed, a super infection or a new infection can occur. Thrush which is pictured here is a white coating or you can have white patches on the tongue, mouth, inner cheeks, and the back of the throat. This is a yeast infection of the mouth. Vaginal yeast infections and black hairy tongue are also super infections that can be caused from antibiotics. With a black hairy tongue, there is an abnormal coating on the tongue which makes it appear black and furry. You may also notice that you see the word Steven Johnson syndrome listed on many of your antibiotics as an adverse effect. This is a hypersensitivity reaction. Steven Johnson syndrome is a life-threatening skin condition in which cell death causes the epidermis to separate from the dermis. The patient can first have flu symptoms 
and then a painful rash will appear and blisters. The cell wall synthesis inhibitors kill the bacteria by preventing them from forming strong protective cell walls. Penicillin was our first antibiotic and saved our soldiers during World War II from dying from infection. Just as soldiers destroy enemy walls, penicillin works by destroying the cell wall. So, for cell wall destroyers, think of PCVN, P for penicillin, C is our cephalosporins and carbapenems, and vancomycin. Penicillin is one of our oldest antibiotics. Many people have allergies to penicillin, so watch for these allergies. Penicillins are used PO, they're used topically, and also we give them IM for things such as strep throat. They're also used prophylactically before minor invasive procedures. Penicillins end in psyllin. You know, penicillins interfere with the action of birth control pills, so patients should be instructed to use backup methods of birth control for protection. Cephalosporins are like penicillin because they, these also destroy the cell wall, but they are more expensive. Cephalosporins can prevent and treat infections. There are four generations of these antibiotics which are based on their activity. With each new group of these drugs, when they're developed, they're called generations. The original drug is first generation. Use of alcohol should be avoided with cephalosporins because of associated abdominal side effects. So maybe for memory think of, with cephalosporins, you can't drink no Captain Morgan. It's important to note that a majority of these antibiotics do not undergo metabolism, or so they must be excreted by the kidney. Cephalosporins have the prefix cep or cep. Carbapenems and vancomycin are also cell wall synthesis destroyers. These medications aren't in your text, but I wanted to quickly review vancomycin. It's getting to be a real popular medication in the hospitals, and it's revert, reserved for severe gram-positive infections. It's used to treat MRSA or methyl-resistant staph aureus infections. It can cause an unusual rash and redness, and it's, this is called red man syndrome. This may happen because of a histamine reaction. Tetracyclines prevent protein synthesis and they're effective against gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria such as gonorrhea, chlamydia, and UTIs. These antibiotics were commonly used in the 1950s and 60s. Many bacteria are now being resistant to these type of antibiotics. Tetracyclines can cause permanent staining in teeth of children or developing fetus, so they are not used in children or pregnant women. Another problem with tetracyclines is that they also cause photosensitivity, which means a sensitivity to UV rays from the sun. This can cause redness that looks like a sunburn. Other side effects are fever and joint pain. Patients should not drink milk or take dairy or calcium with these medications. They can reduce the drug's absorption up to 50%. Tetracyclines end in cycling. Examples are tetracycline and doxycycline. Macrolides are a class of antibiotics and these medications end in myosin. They inhibit protein synthesis. They can be either bactericidal, which means again that they kill the bacteria, or bacterial static, which means they stop it from multiplying. I like this visual mnemonic with the golden arches, macrolides. And I think of ACE. Our three big macrolides are azithromycin, that's your Z-pack, clorithromycin, and erythromycin. Macrolides are used to treat respiratory tract infections, pneumonia, STDs. So I think of ACE, airway clearance, and erotica. Aminoglycosides are heavy hitters in our antibiotic class. These antibiotics are more toxic than other antibiotics, and they're useful against aerobic gram-negative bacteria, such as Pseudomonas, which requires oxygen to grow, and tuberculosis, which are one-celled organisms. Some of these antibiotics are pregnancy class C, and some are class D, so caution with this. Patients taking aminoglycosides should have blood levels of the antibiotic monitored periodically for efficiency and toxic levels. These drugs are nephrotoxic, so we have to watch our BUN and creatinine to make sure our kidneys are working. They're also ototoxic, 
Remember, signs of ototoxicity include tinnitus or ringing in the ears, headache, and ataxia, which is loss of muscle control during voluntary movements. Lastly, these medications can be neurotoxic, causing muscular paralysis. Dizziness is a common side effect, so watch your patient for falls. Administered, um, administration of these medications are topical, such as ointments, um, eye drops, ear drops, or IV injections. Examples are gentamicin and tobramycin. Next classes are quinolones. They're also known as fluorine quinolones, and they're bacterial static, and these antibiotics interfere with DNA synthesis. Fluorine quinolones end with fluoxin and are commonly used for UTI, which is urinary tract infection. Think of fluorine quinolones, F for flow of urine. These medications have rare and some serious side effects. The central nervous system effects include dizziness, confusion, seizures, and there could be colon inflammation. They can also cause damage to the cartilage and tendon rupture. Fluorine quinolones hurt attachment to your bones. How's that? Examples of these are ciprofloxin or cipro. Sulfonamide antibiotics are an early class of antibiotics. This is our last class, so relax. These antibiotics interrupt bacterial metabolism. They collect in the bladder prior to excretion, so they're really effective with treating urinary tract infections. The problem is, is that many individuals have allergies to these sulfa drugs. So again, ask your patient about allergies. Examples are trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazone, there we go, <laughs> or septra. Think of septra, septra stays in the bladder. Rash is common with these antibiotics, so watch that closely. Also, um, just for the endings, you'll see sulfa in your antibiotic word. So um, we'll see that on the prefix when you're looking to identify these drugs. As we conclude um, this lecture on antibiotics, I have to talk about antibiotic resistance. Misuse and overuse of antibiotics have contributed to antibiotic resistance, which is a condition that reduces or eliminates the effectiveness of antibiotics. Antibiotic resistant is a worldwide growing public health concern. When antibiotics don't work, our patients are sick longer, their illnesses get complicated, we have to use more expensive drugs, and more deaths are caused by bacterial infections. Prescribers have to be prudent about ordering antibiotics, and patients have to be taught that if they're ordered antibiotics, they must complete the full course of the drug. It's important to take all of the medicine, even if they're beginning, they're beginning to feel better. As I remarked in the first lecture, tuberculosis is a major player in our world's health. It's increasingly found in the U.S. among immigrants, drug users, and AIDS patients. It's caused by microbacterium tuberculosis. Patients with TB usually take up to four medications simultaneously for up to one year. Tuberculosis microbacterium is able to build up a resistance to anti-tuberculin drugs. So using a combination of drugs helps slow the development of bacterial resistance. So there's four medications, and I think of RIPE. These are our common medications for TB. R is for rifampin. These medications have a unique side effect of which patients and healthcare workers must be aware. It turns body secretions, including sweat, tears, urine, and saliva, a red-orange. They can permanently stain contact lenses. So that needs to be considered. The other medications for TB are INH, pyrazinamide, and ethamputol. Viruses are different than bacteria. They are microorganisms that require a host to, produce, to reproduce themselves, and they must have a host. AIDS, rabies, chickenpox, influenza, and herpes are caused by viruses. The body reacts to most viruses by developing antibodies to fight the invading microorganism naturally. When the body needs help, antiviral and antiretroviral medications are used. This is based on the type of virus. Antiviral therapy is used to inhibit reproduction, but this therapy is really hard because viruses rapidly reproduce. Acyclovir is used to treat herpes, chickenpox, and shingles. Oseltamivir 
is commonly used for influenza and ribavirin is used in treating hepatitis C and RSV, which is respiratory syncytial virus. Retroviruses are different because they have an RNA blueprint. This allows the genetic material from a retrovirus to become a permanent part of the gene of an infected cell. HIV is a retrovirus. AIDS patients may take multiple medications according to a specific regimen to fight this retrovirus and prevent its reproduction and protect their own immune system. Well, this concludes part two of the immune system medications. Please let me know if you have any questions.